food safety conditions in landing and processing activities. So, as with all rules concerning hygiene and food safety, you start at the beginning, which is your location and design. Make sure that the site you have selected for your fish landing site or your fish processing site uh, is not exposed to contamination from its environment, that you can avoid the entry of surface waters, uh, gases, exhaust fumes, dust, and that you have sufficient size uh, and space for the scale of operations which you want to conduct. Uh, so, putting the thing in the right place in the first instance is very important. And then your internal layout should take into account the process flow. Because if you don't get the process flow right, then uh, it becomes a, a constant problem that you're battling against for the entire life of that establishment. And that's why, as competent authorities, uh, you should, and I'm sure you are, when somebody is constructing a new landing site or a new processing facility, one of the steps which they have to go through is submit the plans to you for comment. Uh, <coughs> so that you can assess whether the process flow is compliant, that the arrangement of the different spaces is compliant, as well as uh, the materials being appropriate. Uh, <coughs> so some of the principles in designing your process flow, which are all set out in the uh, relevant manual, uh, some of the principles are to separate your clean and dirty areas, so where raw material comes into the establishment and where maybe an initial processing step is undertaken such as gutting, these are essentially what we would call dirty areas or areas where there is a potential material generated which could ca contaminate uh, products and you separate those from areas where there is uh, handled product which is processed or part processed uh, which you would define as your clean process steps. Uh, you avoid crossing of process lines. There should be a smooth flow of product through the establishment. Even if it is a single room like we have in this example here, you can see if you arrange your tables and your process steps so product moves smoothly from one step to the other and doesn't have to cross and go backwards and forwards. Uh, this facilitates improved hygiene. So avoiding crossing of processing lines. <coughs> Separate the entrances for your product and your people. So product should enter in one entrance, people should enter and leave via another one. Uh, again, stopping people from crossing lines where product is flowing. <coughs> Ideally people should move around the lines rather than across the lines. And then if you have particularly areas where you have cooked or ready to eat products, uh, these are high risk areas where because this product is not going to be cooked again before it is consumed you want to have a higher level of hygiene in those areas so you would put those activities into separate 
rooms and you would even take steps to avoid anything or anybody entering those rooms directly from an area in which raw product had been handled. So you might have a separate entrance for staff. You might have uh, boxes and knives and equipment which are only used exclusively in that area. They can be color coded so that everybody can see this box belongs here and this box belongs elsewhere. Uh, where product is transferred because you have to get the product in uh, there should be a clear demarcation where the product maybe enters an oven from the raw side and is cooked or smoked and is taken out on the clean side so that you never have that raw product entering that area and having separate staff or maybe separate uniforms so that if somebody is going to work in that area they have uh, they have to go and put on a different coat, different boots and, and so on. So having separate areas is also uh, important and all of this is aimed at trying to uh, ensure that our microbiological contamination of the product is uh, kept to a minimum and the reason why we do this is uh, explained by uh, what we call the bacterial growth curve which is an important feature of the way in which bacteria reproduce and multiply and the way in which their population uh, develops which you have to understand in order to have uh, to be able to design our hygienic arrangements in an establishment uh, or on a vessel or elsewhere. Um, so that normally what we see when a bacteria or a population of bacteria as defined by the number in the population when, is, when it is introduced to a new environment so you have your fish coming out of the water for example or your fish coming from a, a chilled environment onto a processing table uh, at that point of course there are a certain number of bacteria which are present on the product but because you have changed the environmental conditions surrounding that bacteria uh, suppose it's going to uh, warm up it has to adjust the population has to adjust to those new conditions in other words some bacteria which like warmer temperatures <coughs> need to wake up and realize that the conditions now are perfect for their growth uh, and whilst they're doing that there's a period we call the lag phase where the number of bacteria doesn't change very much but then those bacteria start to multiply the conditions are perfect for them it's nice and warm uh, they've got moisture there's oxygen available they've got some food to eat in terms of the uh, fish which they're sitting on and they start to multiply <coughs> bacterial multiplication uh, during this phase of growth can be very rapid bacteria multiply by cell division so one bacterial cell becomes two bacterial cells each of those become four bacterial cells these divisions under ideal conditions occur as rapidly as every 20 minutes okay so even if you start with one bacteria after 20 minutes you've got two after 40 minutes you've got four after 60 minutes you have eight after an hour and 20 minutes you have 16 an hour and 40 minutes 32 two hours you have 64 two hours 20 minutes 128 and so on and so on and very quickly you know it's like the 
old Chinese proverb with one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard, two on the second, four on the third. There isn't enough rice in the world to complete the chessboard. So very rapidly you end up with millions and millions of bacteria uh, on the product. And this is an exponential growth rate. It's a logarithmic growth rate, which is why this is a straight line. But what happens is that eventually there is a limiting factor. Usually the substrate, the food, is fully consumed. So at that point uh, the bacteria stop multiplying and in fact eventually because there is no food available for them then they start to die and the numbers decline. So this is your typical bacterial growth curve. Now imagine what happens if we increase the temperature. If we have a a higher temperature, closer to the optimal temperature for reproduction of these bacteria. What happens? Well, it takes them less time to adapt to the new circumstances. Everything is happening more rapidly. Their metabol metabolic rate is increased. <coughs> so we have a much shorter lag phase and we have a much steeper growth phase. In other words, rather than multiply every 20 minutes or divide every 20 minutes, they may divide every 15 minutes. So you get a much shorter lag phase and a much more rapid increase in the number. So of course here you then hit this peak amount much earlier. So you see a enhanced spoilage rate, or enhanced growth rate. So that's the effect of increased temperature, T plus delta T. Now imagine that we have on top of that contamination. Contamination with bacteria that are from the previous batch, say. Now if they are from the previous batch, it means they are already in their growth phase. There's no lag phase involved here. Suppose it's a fish box that wasn't cleaned. So inside that fish box you still have all the fish slime, some guts, uh, you know, bits of fish flesh, some dirt, and that hasn't been removed. The bacteria growing on those things are already in the phase of, uh, in, in this growth phase. So you don't get any lag phase at all. It, the bacteria hit the ground running, you know. All you're doing is providing them with a new food source, as well as increasing the numbers of bacteria. So with contamination, you get increased bacterial load from the outset. If the temperature is high, you get the faster uh, rate of growth and there is no lag phase and you get a large amount of bacteria reproducing very quickly. So this of course then gives you the clue how to control these, uh, these features of bacterial growth quite, quite simply by uh, decontamination, in other words having a very clean product and reducing the temperature because at that point you have if it's very clean you have a very low initial load so less bacteria to start with your temperature is lower therefore you have an extended lag phase and the growth phase is much slower so this is the theory behind all of the hygienic practices which we promote particularly in terms of uh, cleaning and sanitizing and uh, temperature control. So this is what's behind the concepts of the design and construction and when we're designing and constructing establishments or facilities 
what we're trying to do is bear in mind these features of the bacterial growth curve to make it easier, as easy as possible to clean, to remove that contamination and uh, as far as possible then we can ensure that we don't get these higher rates of spoilage and or this is equally applicable to the growth of pathogens as well, this, uh, this bacterial growth curve. So hygienic design and construction, uh, I'm sure you're all very well aware of these, these are fairly standard, uh, essentially everyone who's an inspector has their own little routine of walls, floors, ceiling, ventilation, lighting, drainage, water supply, you know, these are the standard uh, physical checks which you, you make as you go around establishments to, to check. So you check on the flooring, non-slip flooring, waterproof, easy to clean and disinfect, uh, laid down with a slight slope with a gradient so all the water flows towards, uh, towards a drain and uh, doesn't stand around and cause, uh, 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 start going stagnant or have fish blood or, or uh, contaminants in it. Walls which are smooth, easy to clean, durable, impermeable. Uh, don't use ceramic tiles because of the issues with uh, how to keep the clean the, the grout, the parts in between the tiles walls should be completely smooth. Uh, ensure that your ceilings are also easy to clean, <coughs> that there are no parts which can uh, uh, accumulate dust or detritus which could fall onto the product. Uh, ensure that any lighting units in the ceiling are not made with glass, that you don't have exposed fluorescent tubes which could break and fall onto the product. Uh, Ensuring sufficient lighting is there because you can't keep a place clean if you can't see the dirt. So you have to have adequate lighting and it can be artificial or natural. Uh, doors again, uh, no wood in the establishment. Wood is impossible to keep clean because of the porous nature of the surface, can absorb bacteria and you don't get them out uh, so easily. Uh, ventilation uh, has to have an airflow going from uh, as your layout going but in a contrary flow so you go from the clean areas of the establishment to the dirty areas so you're not bringing bacteria uh, in the air from your product reception to processing areas for example yeah mm-hmm Ceramic tiles have at the joints a grout. Keeping that grout clean is almost impossible. So uh, it would be preferable to have a painted smooth surface that you could wash down completely uh, because of that feature of tiles. Now if you have a uh, you know proprietary food grade wall panelling with uh, epoxy jointing and I mean you can get wall panels which have uh, so like a little T-shaped uh, jointing arrangement so if, if, this is your, if this is your wall, you have a panel which is stuck to the surface here. You, then this is your next panel. Right, that was also stuck to the surface. 
Normally, if this was a normal grouting compound, you'd just, you'd just grout that and you would have bacteria could potentially be in there. But what you can do, if, if you have an arrangement like this, which is a T-shaped insert, right, which is glued, very often they're like that, so they're smooth, then you, that would be okay. Yeah. I mean, ceramic tiles are also very fragile and yeah. very often they don't no, sustain. Ceramic yeah. But what about the joints? The joints? It's the joints which, you know, we're worried about because they can harbour dirt. Yeah. Yeah, honey. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you run pipe work off the wall and things yeah, like that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I mean, th this is ideal. If you have epoxy, resin, uh, wall panelling with proper sealants and things like that, and these little uh, inserts over the joints, that would be your ideal. Uh, then yeah after that it's a question of I think balancing what is available with what is practical uh, I take the point that if you have painted surfaces that there is a more frequent maintenance requirement but at least there you end up with a completely smooth uh, surface okay so so back back to more mundane issues uh, about how we prevent Cross-contamination in this case, uh, yeah, it's all a question of separating uh, raw products from cooked products. Again, your process flows. Uh, ensuring that we keep things clean and sanitized between batches so that we're not introducing contamination from bacteria in its growth phase. Uh, like we've done here, colour coding of equipment, knife handles, cutting boards and so on. Very useful way of ensuring that we don't use the uh, wrong equipment for the wrong purposes. Uh, same for boots and coats, can all be colour coded by area if you want to ensure that these things don't introduce contamination where it should not be. And don't forget the power of hand washing. Major, uh, a major issue of importance in prevention of cross contamination. Waste storage and disposal. Uh, ensuring that there are adequate waste bins in the establishment, that they are easy to clean and disinfect. Again, they can be color coded according to the kind of waste or the area in which they are to be used. Um, and of course, the size of these bins has to be considered so that we don't have large quantities of waste building up in, uh, in areas where food is handled. If you have them sufficiently large for convenient processing, but not so large so that they have to be em emptied frequently throughout the day and again when they are emptied that they're cleaned and disinfected uh, periodically. So that's having waste bins within the establishment as we see here and then some external waste storage area where it should be smooth, uh, smooth floor and walls, water supply drainage so you can wash it down effectively. Measures to prevent entry of vermin, pests, domestic animals. Uh, adequate number of sealable waste containers so that you can seal them and make sure that insects don't get in there, reduce the fly hazard. Uh, keep the area clean and as with all of these things ensure that somebody is, is responsible. So unlike this one, which, <laughs> which we found, which you know, is not a particularly good example of uh, how, to, how to manage your external waste storage area. Then uh, pests. We need to take care that the pests are uh, prevented from entry and uh, if they are inevitable that they are subject to uh, uh, elimination. So here we're concerned with rodents, rice, mat, uh, mice and rats, uh, flying insects, uh, crawling insects, uh, pests of stored products such as beetles and mice, mites, 
can be a problem in the fishery sector with dried fish and uh, salted fish. Uh, birds also can get into fish processing areas and domestic animals. And here what we're really concerned about is the transmission of uh, microorganisms, uh, pathogenic bacteria and parasites, either directly physically because those pests might visit uh, other locations and transmit the bacteria or the parasites physically on their legs or wings or bodies into the establishment or because of their feeding habits they may uh, harbour pathogenic bacteria and excrete them onto the, onto the food. Uh, so particularly things like rodents for example uh, contamination with rodent feces is a is an important source of salmonella food poisoning for example and the other way in which pests can be a food safety hazard is by damaging uh, packaging so quite often you have uh, mice or rats which will eat away the packaging and then allow the entry of other other pests uh, so we have to be aware of pest identification to be able to identify where there are pests and this can be via contracted professional pest surveys uh, on routine awareness training, sighting logs. This is some of the equipment you might need to be able to spot pests. <coughs> uh, certainly part of the training of food inspectors should include elements of pest control to be able to identify uh, and control pests. As I say we have exclusions so <coughs> preventing them from getting in in the first place is the ideal so screening windows and doors uh, <coughs> restricting their uh, reproduction or presence once they do enter by ensuring that for example all waste is removed on a periodic basis, keeping the place clean, good lighting and ventilation. <coughs> <coughs> and then finally, if you do happen to uh, have a significant presence, then there has to be an elimination. There's a reference here, which I think is also given in the manual. Uh, which is uh, from the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health in the UK. It's a very, very good document on pest control. Uh, the best one there is. Uh, and once you read this, there's not much point in reading anything else, actually. It's uh, such a good document. No, no. No, nothing to do with me at all. It's just my, my professional opinion. <coughs> uh, I'm not even a member of that institute. I used to be a long time ago, but uh, uh, not anymore. And then uh, having a routine standard operating procedure for pest control and management which sets out uh, a control method to be applied, uh, ensuring that there's routine monitoring and treatment, record keeping of observations and treatments applied, and many larger operators, food business operators, will have a contract with a contractor for pest control rather than undertaking these things in-house. 
um, because of the specialised nature of the services uh, required. <coughs> then personal hygiene is something we need to consider. Uh, we pay attention to this because of the risk of contamination due to poor personal cleanliness particularly related to uh, use of the toilet and washing hands and things like that uh, but not, that's not the only thing uh, sometimes people can have an illness or a condition which could impact on food safety and also the way in which they behave is uh, important uh, and this brings in the issue of uh, proper training uh, yes the photograph uh, uh, yeah it's uh, it's Pangasius I think in Vietnam yeah yeah That's quite a factory, isn't it, really? I think most of those in the EU would be um, like automated, the, the, the processes and so forth. Well, not, may, well, maybe in some places they would yeah. be. But <coughs> you see, the thing is, uh, hand filleting gives you a higher yield. Hand filleting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You get a higher yield. And if your labor costs are sufficiently low, then it becomes uh, a viable. Uh, way of processing to do this and I, I've been in these factories and uh, you know this is a small one I've seen <laughs> you can hardly see the other side of the factory in some cases with thousands and thousands of people uh, you know in one company I think the largest Pangasius producer turns over 600 million dollars a year 600 million, you know, over half a billion a year in this one product. It's an amazing business. <coughs> and this is all from aquaculture as well. Interesting, huh? Very interesting. But imagine controlling this workforce from a hygiene point of view. A, a big challenge, actually, a massive challenge. Uh, you know, you have, these are some of the things that you have to consider about diarrheal diseases. You know, you, you got, you've got a workforce of several thousand at any one time, somebody's going to have diarrhea, for sure, but inevitably, just from a <coughs> infected noses uh, and throats, Staphylococcus aureus, can put an exotoxin onto your product. Yeah. That's why they're all wearing face masks. Open or infected uh, cuts and wounds. Okay, well, they're, they're all wearing gloves here. Great. So that's some of the things we need to think about. Uh, health status excluding carriers or suspect carriers of foodborne diseases from food handling areas uh, <coughs> yeah absolutely important <coughs> ensuring that people report illnesses or symptoms of illnesses but you have to be a little bit canny here because if somebody knows that they're not going to be allowed to work that day and they're not going to be paid then they're not going to report the fact that they've got a health problem uh, so there has to be a clear policy about when people report an illness that they don't get financially penalized by it otherwise they will never report it to you Mm. 
Well, well, like a few day, a few days off. Yeah, you can b tell them to bring a sick a, a note from their doctor. I mean, that's okay. But it's not a question of taking days off uh, either. You know, you have to find some work for them, perhaps, which is not in a food uh, as a food handling position. You know, you put them in the office, or they're sweeping up the outside, or you know, uh, working on the driving the forklift truck or something else for that for that period. Uh, any open cuts or wounds should be protected. I mean, these are all basic hygiene rules. Uh, <coughs> medical examination and certification. Uh, are these requirements in all of your countries? Do, does, anybody, does anybody not have a medical certification requirement? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean they're fairly standard these days and we put them in all the regulations. Uh, my own view, which is a personal view, is these are just snapshots and it is only evidence of the health status of that person at the moment you take those samples. Uh, and if you take them every year, well you're testing them on one day, but maybe there's 364 days when they could be excreting salmonella or ill in some way, which you are not catching by this control method. So, yeah, they're probably useful for identifying chronic carriers, and some people are chronic, asymptom, uh, asymptomatic carriers of amoebas, of salmonella, uh, and you would catch them with these medical certifications, but whether they actually contribute much more beyond that is debatable. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is where training comes in. Staff should be trained and to know that if they have any of these symptoms, jaundice, diarrhea, vomiting, fevers, sore throats, infected skin lesions, uh, discharges from the upper respiratory tract, they should report to the business operator because they could be symptoms of some of these uh, diseases which could be readily transmitted uh, via their food handling activities. Um, of course keeping a high degree of personal cleanliness apart from that, keeping cuts and wounds covered with waterproof dressing so there are good and bad practices there, these are all fairly standard things. Having a first aid kit available with waterproof dressings, uh, covers for fingers, if you cut your finger you can put on a rubber uh, kind of finger glove or a proper rubber glove uh, and so on. Having adequate protective clothing, uniforms to cover the head and any facial hair so now we ask people if they have a beard to to put a cover over the beard as well. Uh, coats and aprons, appropriate footwear. Uh, bear in mind that there should be some facilities for changing clothes so that external clothes and personal effects are not brought into a food area and that there is a need to have a laundry facility. So the business operator themselves should launder the protective clothing uh, rather than workers taking them home and washing them themselves, which does happen sometimes. Uh, because there you have no guarantee that the uh, laundry is being done correctly. Does everybody know how to wash their hands? Has, everyone, has anyone been trained in hand washing? Uh, on the alphabet, by washing hands. 
Hum, hum the alphabet. But what about the procedures? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole series of particular moves which you have to make. And it's worthwhile, you know, checking out a video on YouTube because these things are they're similar to the way in which surgeons will uh, scrub up before they make an operation. But there's all sorts of no nooks and crannies on your hand which can harbor bacteria. And hand washing is very important. So you have to get rid of all your rings and jewelry and you know, make sure you wash around the ends of your fingers and in this, this part of your hand and the backs of your hands and so on. And there's a set procedure which you, uh, you can follow and to ensure that food handlers are properly trained in hand washing techniques is an important uh, part of this process. So not only the uh, technique of washing hands but when they should wash hands. Um, so here we have some examples when you start work or restart work after a break, after using the toilet, handling raw food uh, or any contaminated material or taking out the waste bin after those steps you should wash hands after doing cleaning and then periodically so <coughs> uh, and for hand washing of course there has to be sufficient facilities provided soap or detergent hot water you must have hot water the, the effectiveness of hand washing uh, in hot water is several times greater than when cold water is used all other things being equal because of the detergency effect of the soap and the hot water in removing grease and it's grease on your skin or uh, which is where the where the bacteria are harbored and by using hot water you can degrease much more effectively. Uh, using non-hand operated taps because of course if you use a hand operated tap you wash your hands, you turn the tap on with a, the tap on with a dirty hand, you wash your hands, hands are nice and clean and then you turn the tap off again with your clean hand but pick up the bacteria you put there previously. So non-hand operated taps are now uh, a universal requirement. Single-use paper towels or hot air, disinfectant hand dips and hand washing reminders. And an important standard operating procedure for any food business operator is to monitor the hand washing effectiveness. It's very simple, very simple. You just have a little record form and you keep a record of people entering the processing area. How many people wash their hands? How many don't? And then also you can take swabs. Uh, <coughs> last week for, uh, we had here one of the uh, suppliers uh, of rapid microbiological testing kits, a company called Biofarm and there are very nice little uh, mini Petri dishes which you just open them up and you put a contact and then close them up and incubate them for 24 hours and then you have an indicator of the level of uh, hygiene and these are perfect for monitoring hand washing so it's not the absolute number of bacteria that you might see but any changes over time would be indicative of a hand washing uh, <coughs> a failure to effectively wash hands yeah yeah. Then personal behavior also important. So these are standard food safety uh, requirements. I think most people's regulations have got these. Personal hygiene of food handlers we've, we've, we've co uh, covered. 
Uh, management of non-food chemicals. It's very important. You have to bear in mind that most food processing or fish processing establishments uh, also have non-food chemicals uh, which they need to be able to perform their activities. So these can be things like cleaning compounds and different ones for different purposes. Uh, sanitizing compounds, in other words for removing or killing bacteria. Pest control materials, we mentioned pest control a, a few minutes ago. Lubricants for equipment, these are all common typical materials which you need in, a, uh, in any food processing environment. Uh, the problem is that many of these uh, materials could represent food safety hazards as well. So you need to take ex extra special care to make sure that they are properly controlled. So check on things like lockable storage, separate lockable storage away from uh, food materials. So you don't keep all of your uh, ingredients and your cleaning materials and your lubricants in the same store. You have to have separate storage areas for s separate things. And ideally there should be restricted access. Only certain people who are responsible for that part of the activity should have access. So, you know, uh, cleaning compounds are only accessible by people who are engaged in cleaning activities. Uh, ensure containers are clearly labelled. Never reuse containers. Never use an old uh, vegetable oil drum for storing cleaning chemicals, for example. Uh, complete no-no. Uh, ensure that there are written instructions available for the use and that anyone who is going to use these materials is properly trained and only those people undertake them. And importantly, keep a record of their use so that you can ensure you know when they are used. So here's a, here's a nice picture of a, a fish processing factory. This is one of my favorite uh, fish processing establishments, which I liked very much. And I wonder if you can see some of the examples of good hygienic practices which we can observe in this in this photograph. Yeah, nice plastic aprons. Yeah, well, they're all well dressed, aren't they? They've got uh, they've got gloves, masks, hair covering, white coats, plastic aprons, boots. Very good. Good, uh, good employee uniforms, protective clothing. What else can we see going on here? Yeah, stainless steel tables here. Excellent. Also, this is a waste receptacle, right, which is a plastic barrel, high density polythene, easy to clean. Similarly, this uh, fish box here, which is where I think the raw material comes in, is again nice high density polythene. And these ones here, and these blue fish boxes, which they have also in plastic. Yep, smooth walls, painted walls. <laughs> uh, and uh, a nice, uh, really a good floor here, good floor covering. Anything else? Um, 
What's this guy doing? Can you can't really okay, see? Okay, then I notice that the um, the rats the rats for the trees. Also. Yeah. Yeah, stainless steel, I think. Yeah. yeah. The question though, what are they doing on here? They're filleting these the group. Filleting? Filleting grouper. Filleting grouper? Yeah. Big grouper. Awesome. This guy, you can't really see, but actually he's cleaning. He's got a squeegee in his cleaning the floor as, as they go. Anything else? What's, what's all, what's this here? Can you see this bit here? It's a wash basin. Soap. Towel. It's a foot operated, or I think it's knee operated wash basin. So these are some of the things, yeah. All surfaces, equipment easy to clean, head covering, uniforms. Question though, did that area come to control? Yes, it is actually. Yeah, it was. Um, but the fish are laying around the door and heat up ice. Um, you can see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it depends how long they take to process these ones on the table. Uh, and I don't think they were taking very long for each one, to be honest. Um, in terms of the um, temperature of the room, right, people are not thinking about sorts of figures for that. Um, we have like a suggested or a figure at which you are um, well, n no, no, because there is no kind of recommended temperature for uh, an air-conditioned fish processing room. And you may not need uh, air conditioning at all if your time on the tables is very short. So it's a question of managing the work so that any temperature elevation of the product is kept to a, a minimum. So, yeah, I mean, if you have tons and tons of products standing around without ice, I would say uh, this would be a problem. But, you know, here the fish is in the big polythene bins and they've got, what, one, two, three, f four fish on the table while they're working on three fish. So, However long it takes them to fill it a, a grouper, a couple of minutes maybe, you know, it's not going to make a big, a big difference. Uh, and then, yeah, hand washing and drying. So that's a, a good example. And here we have a guy filleting tilapia. So what's wrong with this? Everything. 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 Yeah, that's a, that's about it, really. But specifically, <laughs> yeah, yeah, wood, a wooden table, wooden stool, yeah. D well, it could even be a wooden floor. I don't know. Uh, even it's cool, even it's cool, uh, but yeah. look at the state of his trousers here. Yeah, very dirty. Uh, so he's even sitting on a on a cloth cushion here. So yeah. And what's this down here? No, no, that's that's all the gills and guts from the from the fish just going on the floor there. Yeah. Exactly. Well said. No, it's very, very badly lit. So yeah, you can't you can't really see what's going on. So. 
That's our first assumption. You, you mean this? Yeah. Really? Okay, I'm not so sure. But I'll take it. I'll take your word for it. Uh, so badly lit. Dirty clothes, no protective clothing, no hat. Uh, wooden equipment, chopping board, stool, knife handle, and dirty fish boxes. So plenty going on there, and no receptacle for fish waste. Okay, here's another guy. Crushing ice for fish processing. So what's wrong with this one? Yeah, look at the look at the place that he's doing it. Just a a mud a mud floor. It's just in the public area in the open air. Yeah, exactly. The environment isn't controlled. It's public access. Access. So there's people walking around, cars. I, I think I think this was the guy providing the ice for this factory actually. <laughs> Area not smooth or easy to drain, yeah. Yeah, and I think he had here a, a basket. It was just like a a wicker basket for receiving the crushed ice. So not good. Yeah, so there are some examples. I'm sure we've all seen good and bad examples similar to these in our uh, professional experience. Okay, so all of those things are the basic hygiene rules. I, I think everybody's pretty fam familiar with them. Uh, but then we need to think about the uh, a little bit more about specific processing conditions linked to the particular nature of, of the product. So apart from these uh, contamination issues, we need to think about some specific conditions, monitoring times, temperatures, use of ice and so on. Uh, additives we always have to think about as well uh, in that very often various additives may be required in fish processing environments. So, for example, uh, permitted additives are sulfites, which we might want to use in the shrimp sector or in dried fish or in uh, cephalopod processing. They're all permitted uses. Uh, various sulfites again have to be monitored from a food safety point of view because uh, from a regulatory aspect there are maximum limits which are placed. The limits are higher in fresh rather than cooked products because cooked products will be consumed uh, directly whereas fresh or frozen products will be subject to cooking and these materials are volatile so that the levels are reduced when you cook them. And then we have also some limits for uh, polyphosphates. Someone was asking about polyphosphates yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so these are not particularly toxic but there are recommendations in terms of good manufacturing practices. Uh, sorry? Cry, cry, yeah, cryoprotectants. Uh, and there are, you, you may find other products which are also used in a fish processing context, various proprietary products uh, which are sometimes used but in terms of EU supplies, these are, these are the ones which are of importance and this is the regulation which we rely on. Uh, one interesting aspect is tuna treated with carbon monoxide. 
Have you come across this as an issue at all? Yeah, I mean it's, it's a process which is very effective at altering the colour of tuna uh, because the carbon monoxide reacts with the uh, myoglobin in the muscle. Myoglobin is the muscle pigment, pigment which gives muscle its, its colour. Uh, so normally tuna is a deep red uh, and it will go to bright red with oxygen after a, a day or two and then that bright red colour will change to brown maybe they say from day three to five so when people are grading tuna they're usually doing it on the basis of, of, of the colour uh, now if you treat it with carbon monoxide the, the carbon monoxide latches on to the myoglobin molecule so incidentally it's why carbon monoxide is such a toxic gas to humans you know yeah. when, when people commit suicide by using the exhaust from their car it is the carbon monoxide which latches on to their uh, haemoglobin and, and asphyxiates them uh, so in this case it's exactly the same chemical reaction the carbon monoxide grabs on to the myoglobin molecule and doesn't let it go and this is used because the uh, carboxymyoglobin has got this bright pink color and it is maintained until the fish spoils and the disadvantage of that, I mean it doesn't do any harm to the consumer as such, it's not harmful carboxymyoglobin, but the disadvantage is you cannot detect any subsequent spoilage changes to the product. So uh, it does have food safety applications and in fact there was an outbreak uh, last year in the USA with 43 salmonella uh, cases including a number were hospitalized by eating uh, sushi uh, which was contaminated with the salmonella uh, and it had been treated with carbon monoxide so now I mean this is a permitted treatment in the USA the US allows this uh, but it's not permitted in some other countries including the EU for the simple reason that it masks spoilage changes. Mahi Mahi, uh, the dolphin fish might also sometimes be treated with it. So it's worth bearing in mind I don't know if your own legislation says anything about this treatment but I am aware that in some Caribbean countries there is an import of tuna from the USA. Uh, this, is the, this is the company which promotes the technology, it's a Dutch company uh, called ANOVA and they've just been granted their US patent for this process. Uh, it's called clear smoke because one of the ways in which you produce the carbon monoxide is by partial combustion of, of wood but then they scrub out all of the uh, PAHs so all of the partially combusted uh, organic products are removed by bubbling through water and scrubbing them out so you end up essentially with a mixture of air and carbon monoxide which is then passed over the uh, over the fish uh, so be aware it's probably coming your way uh, sometime soon <laughs> <laughs> sorry Ch tuna is used extensively in canning but this application isn't used in canning uh, because once you, once you cook the tuna you have the colour change anyhow 
and the myoglobin is, is denatured. So, uh, you can also use nitrites to uh, change the color of the product, but that also substantially changes its nature as well. It becomes more of a cured product in that case. Okay, so that's, uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about uh, uh, processing, the processing side. Are there any other questions? Okay, well let's, let's now go for lunch.